Hi, everybody. Um, a lot of you in this room um, know me, um, but I will, for those of you who don't know me, I'll tell you a little bit about myself in a second. Um, I am going to be presenting on inclusive teaching practices um, in higher education, um, both from a faculty perspective and from a student perspective. Um, so I surveyed both populations. Um, so uh, this is me, I am Lisa Abrams. I am late diagnosed, both autistic and have ADHD. Um, I have known both of these things, ADHD for about two years and autism for about one year. Um, and I just turned 40, so this was uh, quite a surprise. Um, and I've done a lot of thinking over the last couple years about how uh, my disabilities have affected me um, in my job, um, like in retrospect, how they might have affected me in the classroom. Um, and so a lot of what I'm doing now, while not exactly guided by those diagnoses, because I was engaging in some of this before, um, is really taking a look at how can we make um, education much more inclusive. Um, I am currently the, an assistant professor and the chair of the psychology department here at Rowan. Um, and this is one of my favorite pieces of art. Um, this is a micro etching of a part of the brain called the hippocampus. Um, this, is, this part of the brain is what actually got me into um, my first graduate degree program, which is a PhD in behavioral neuroscience. Um, this is the part of the brain that is most affected by things like chronic stress and trauma. And that topic is really what got me into studying um, neuroscience. Um, this art piece is made by somebody who turned into an artist after getting their PhD in neuroscience. Um, if you have been to the Franklin Institute, um, I don't know, in the past like five or so years, there's a big like brain exhibit and there's a huge micro etching of the human brain and they do the lights and it flashes. It's the same artist. Um, and so my focus, although my PhD is in behavioral neuroscience and I do still teach in that area, um, my career focus has really been on student learning and inclusive teaching. So it's something, you know, teaching is something that I figured out that I was really passionate about when I was in grad school. I had like career trajectory to go into industry, to, into like a pharmaceutical company to do research or a biotech company. And I really just fell in love with teaching college students. And so since then, it's been like 13 years, I think, since I got my PhD. Um, I've really focused on student learning um, because I think that it's so important. So the research that I do um, is primarily, is actually solely now really focused on student learning. So this is one of the projects, the project that I'm using for this degree program. Um, I'm in this degree program uh, because I don't have a lot of or any uh, formal education in diversity and inclusion, but it's been such an important part of my career, and I really want it to be an even more important part of my career moving forward, so that is why I am here. So I'm gonna go over my project um, in its entirety, so I'll give you some background information. Um, I'll talk about what my aims were for this study. I'll talk about results, um, the methods, and then results, and then I will talk about some implications that my research has um, indicated, you know, things, how I'm interpreting the data, and then some ideas for future research. So starting off with background information, I think one of the most important things that I want you to know is what is inclusive, uh, what are inclusive teaching strategies, because that's what the entire scope of this presentation is going to be on. And so really these inclusive teaching strategies are any teaching strategy that is going to create meaningful and accessible learning for all students, right? At, its, at the base definition of what this is, that's really what we're focusing on. Um, they're addressing the needs of different students with different abilities. They're addressing the needs of students uh, from different backgrounds and what the ultimate goal of using these strategies are is to have students feel valued in their learning environment. And so that's, this is really what we are focusing on today. 
Um, so when we are talking about um, inclusive teaching strategies, a lot of the research has been focused on disability. Um, now, the, I got this update um, recently, about 21% of undergraduate students have a disability. Um, this is up about 10%, so almost doubled in the last 10 or 12 years. Um, so about 10 years ago, it was about 11%. Um, and so you might be thinking maybe that's because of COVID. I know that COVID, both mental health-wise and physical health-wise, has taken a toll. But this number is actually from the 2019-2020 school year. So this is like really not capturing a lot of that uh, the COVID effects, if there are any. And we know that students that have disabilities are reporting poorer academic performance and that the traditional methods of college teaching really aren't addressing the needs of students with disabilities, right? And so um, for the last few decades, a lot of the focus on uh, teaching in general and teaching in higher education has really been like, what kind, how can we change the traditional ways to be more inclusive, to reach more um, more and more students. And so one of the things that I think Lynn mentioned um, is universal design. And so this is really emphasizing the need to create environments that are accessible to the, mo the highest number of people so that we can move away from individual accommodation. So if we're creating environments that are accessible, then we will not have to accommodate individual people. And as we apply universal design to learning, um, it's putting inclusion at the center of teaching practices. Um, so universal design started out as an architectural co like concept. Um, and when we put it, uh, apply it to learning, it's really creating environments, learning environments that are going to be accessible to the most number of students. Um, because right now, the model that we have is that we have classrooms that might not be accessible, but then students, individual students, have accommodations that can be put in place that then you know, are supposed to equalize the playing field in the learning environment um, where universal design is really arguing for like, let's change the environment. And so the goal of universal design is really um, seeing students with disabilities not as an other in the classroom, but rather seeing all of the students in, in a spectrum of both strengths and weaknesses um, and differing abilities and interests. And so that's really um, the theoretical framework that I'm working on for this project. So the research on attitudes towards inclusive uh, teaching strategies um, is basically saying like, look, both facu like faculty feel positively about inclusive teaching strategies, right? So like, if we were going to give them a survey, that's what they would find. However, there tends to be a discrepancy between the attitudes that they have and the actions that they're taking. So they may value and say this is positive, their attitude is positive, but it's not showing in their actions. And that's for a lot of reasons. It's not necessarily for a lack of disinterest, but there are a lot of barriers to implementing, um, like very, very real barriers to implementing inclusive teaching strategies. And so uh, earlier research from about a little over a decade ago was saying that faculty who do have disability awareness training, it actually does not relate to the number of inclusive teaching practices you have. So there really was a question as far as like how effective are these trainings? You know, is professional development going to be helpful in changing not only the attitudes, but because it can change attitudes, but if it's not changing actions, then what are we really even doing? And so on students also generally have a positive attitude about inclusive teaching practices. Um, and they rate some of the practices as more important than the faculty, right? So like faculty and students tend to have like just general positive attitudes about inclusive teaching, but they may rate them a little bit differently, like uh, in order of importance, the types of practices. So my study um, is really, or what I'm presenting to you today, is really looking to see um, 
what students and faculty perceive to be inclusive teaching strategies, like out of their own brain, like what do they think is going to count as inclusive teaching. I also want to compare faculty and student attitudes and actions towards the inclusive teaching practices. So the actions are the faculty actions, but I'm getting responses from both students and faculty about faculty actions. So we've got that going on. And then I also want to determine whether there's a relationship between professional development that focuses on inclusive teaching and also the actions that we see faculty reporting in the classroom. And so how did I go about getting this information? Um, I, had, I sent out an online survey to both students, uh, primarily in our Essentials of Psychology classes oh, from like 2019 to like 2022. That, that was the, the few years that I was collecting data. Um, then I also sent it to faculty. Um, and it was a completely online survey. And so what I will be presenting on today is what are examples of uh, inclusive teaching strategies. That's a question I posed to them. I also had everybody take an inclusive teaching strategy inventory to quantify attitudes and actions related to inclusive teaching. And I also got some demographics, which um, I'm going to show you just so I can describe my, my samples to you. But also, I asked the questions about disability. I asked questions about whether faculty have gone to workshops you know, on inclusive teaching so I can get at that information. And although I'm not talking about it tonight, um, this part of the study is a smaller part of a larger study where I also showed, showed participants different versions of like a flexible grading um, like syllabus, like with different flexible grading options, and got feedback both from faculty and students about that. Uh, that I'm not going to go into that today, but it was part of this study. So the measures, the main measure that I used was the Inclusive Teaching Strategies Inventory, which asked about fa uh, attitudes. Um, and so it's attitudes about inclusive teaching that your faculty member does. Um, and then actions. So a faculty member would be like, I do these things. Um, and a student would say, my instructors do these things. These are the four, they're four, there's more than four. Um, these are the eight subscales of the inclusive teaching strategies inventory. Um, so these are basically like categories of different types of inclusive teaching and include things like accommodations, which is changing class material or methods in order to accommodate students. Um, you know, things like inclusive lecture and classroom strategies. So these, all of these subscales had a, at least four items under them with like examples of what would fall under those um, categories. And so uh, faculty and students rated items from all of these different categories, both um, their attitudes and the actions that faculty do. And I also asked them, I, posed, I showed them the definition that I showed you about inclusive teaching strategies. And I asked them, based on your experience, please list all teaching strategies or techniques that you think meet the qualification of an inclusive strategy. So there was an open-ended response. And I also had them rank the importance of different teaching strategy categories. So things like making accommodations, providing accessible course material, inclusive assessment, some things that are mirroring the inclusive teaching strategies inventory. So I basically had them rank like what is the most important to what is the least important of these things. So in terms of my sample, um, my demographics for faculty was largely white, like 92% white. Um, and the age is, the average age was about 48 years old, which is not, uh, it is a little problematic that my sample was all, almost all white, but it's not necessarily problematic that the age was 48. I'm just going to compare it to the student ages. When we take a look at the breakdown for race or ethnicity, we definitely have a lot more uh, variability, a lot more diversity in our student sample. Um, and I do want to point out the difference 
in ages, which totally makes sense. This was not surprising. But the average age of my, of my student sample was 19. So these were like young college students on average, which also makes sense because they were in Essentials of Psychology. So for faculty and students, I asked about their disability statuses. And so for faculty, uh, there was about a quarter of them that say, yes, I have a disability. But most of those people did not ever have an accommodation for school or work. And the two most commonly reported types of disabilities are psychological disorders, which also I had listed ADHD separately. I also asked the same questions of students. Again, we've got about 20%, 21%, which is exactly the same number that was reported <laughs> um, earlier. But that's, I reported that from like national data, um, not my own data. <laughs> they also generally don't have accommodations. right? And they also have a lot of psychological disorders. So we're not even primarily talking about people with physical disabilities or cognitive disabilities. We are talking about people who have a lot, like who have mental illnesses, is the most common disability in college students and college faculty. So what did I find? Um, one of the things that I was looking at were like, what are people's ideas of inclusive teaching strategies? And so I looked at, I, I, I created themes from each individual um, entry. And essentially, these are the five most common themes that showed up both for faculty and students in the order of like the most to the least. So faculty rated additional faculty supports, like supporting your student outside of the class with office hours, with additional materials, with checking in with them, with providing feedback on assignments. Anything like that was in that category. We also have safe, inclusive spaces. Right, the like in actual environment, the student wants like making students feel comfortable, included, and safe. Um, creating and distributing accessible materials. Be engaging, like the faculty, like the faculty should be engaging. That was one of the themes, <laughs> and encouraging student interactions. And I'll tell you why the, this bottom one is red in like 30 seconds. Um, the students had the same top five themes, right? So in general, students and faculty are conceptualizing inclusive teaching strategies similarly. However, they were in a slightly different order. Their top two were the same, but just flipped. So from student qualitative data, we were looking at the most important or the most uh, mentioned are creating safe, inclusive spaces. Right? That is the most number one thing that students are listing as being in, uh, inclusive teaching strategies, um, followed by those faculty supports. But the third one for students was encouraging student interaction. That was the last one of the five for faculty. So students are saying, I want to talk to other students more, like group work, participating in class, those kinds of things. They're rating it as more important than faculty. They also want faculty to be engaging. <laughs> and uh, this bottom here is the accessible materials. So they're rating, like they're answering um, in their open-ended responses. Um, they had fewer mentions of accessible materials, but more mentions of uh, encouraging students to interact with each other. So which I thought was really interesting, right? This also goes to the, the thing I said before, which largely students and faculty are having the same sort of attitudes towards these things, but may have different priorities. And so I do have um, a sequence of slides that is going to show you quotes from each of those categories. And I have side by side uh, faculty quotes and student quotes for each of those um, broader categories. So I want you just to take maybe like five or 10 seconds to take a look at these. And then you know, we're going to discuss some things that I noticed. And this bottom says good communication is what that says. OK. So when it comes to faculty supports in particular, um, one of the things that did show up 
um, in both sides was really being open to working with students outside of the classroom. That was incredibly important to students, right? They want one-on-one -on -one time. They want the faculty members just to want to help. Like, that's really the vibe that I was getting from the student responses. Um, they want faculty to reach out to students. This could be people cited mental, uh, mental health uh, Concerns. They cited, you know, if my grade goes down, please, like, you know, I want my faculty to reach out to me. Um, and faculty are saying, like, look, we want to, you know, we offer help outside of the classroom. But they're also doing things like breaking down assignments into smaller chunks to help kind of scaffold those assignments and doing things like recording class sessions for people who aren't there. So there seems to be. Um, not a disconnect between these two types of answers, but the students were very much more focused on that one-on-one -on -one additional help time, um, as opposed to things like recording class discussions or breaking down assignments. Um, this is the safe, inclusive space. So again, take a couple seconds to look at some of the highlighted um, quotes here. Students really want to feel safe with their faculty member. They want to feel safe with their classmates. And they want to feel respected by those same people. They want their professors to know their names. They want them to use their pronouns. Right? They want them not to be biased. There was like literally a couple of comments under this that were like, don't discriminate, like don't stereotype against me because of my race, like don't be biased. Um, and the students really want to like this faculty to like notice them and to value them. And I saw that a lot in the faculty side as well, right? Creating a safe space, like saying that this is a safe space, acknowledging differences, celebrating differences, respecting differences, um, having diverse readings for their, for their classes. And my, personally, I don't know if we're supposed to have favorites when it comes to research like responses, but my favorite was connection before content, right? So like on both sides of the student and faculty perspectives is really saying like the connection and the respect is really important. And students rated this, students mentioned this more than faculty, right? So like that was students number one, faculty's number two. When it comes to accessible materials, just take a few seconds to take a look at these. This bottom one says a picture is worth uh, a thousand words, whatever that phrase is. So with these accessible materials, we see the faculty literally citing universal design for learning. Um, so that was a very common comment um, for faculty. But we also see like giving materials through different means, making of materials um, free for students, like using OER materials, uh, open education resource. These are free materials for students having a variety of different kinds of assignments, using accommodations. And we see that largely mirrored on the student side as well. But they, one of the things that students mentioned over and over and over was the use of visuals when it comes to learning. Um, so they really want a visual along with the verbal. Um, one of the things that I personally, um, this is reaching out to students with accommodations first. It takes the onus away from the student to have to approach the professor to say, I need this, um, because there is a power differential between faculty and students. And that could be really intimidating. And they also mentioned physical accessibility. So like, if they have an in-person sort of um, demonstration or activity that they're doing in the class, make sure that it's physically accessible for everybody. Pacing was another um, make things accessible. Um, a, a handful of students said that they want things to go more slowly. Our second to last one is be engaging. Now this is the faculty member being engaging. <laughs> faculty are doing that by figuring out what the students are interested in and tailoring their types of questions or problems to them incorporating the f different um, background, uh, different contributions of people. 
contributions of different backgrounds um, in their materials. Um, having hands-on was big, like a lot of students also want hands-on material, and letting the students choose their topic assignments, right? Like having it be engaging, all of that kind of stuff. Students were really saying like, ask me questions, call on me, that was one of them, I was surprised. But <laughs> actually, <laughs> it was like call on me in class, um, like cold calling was like what they said. I was like, well, okay. Um, asking broad questions so that people with differing backgrounds can all answer. Giving out rewards for participating. Literally, this reinforcement thing showed up a bunch in the data for students. Like, they want to be reinforced in the classroom. Um, and it seemed like they just wanted like praise as opposed to like stuff. And last but not least, encourage student interactions. This is the one that the students found more important than the faculty. So this is the one where faculty tend to put people in different groups, sometimes on purpose, mixing up the group so people interact with different people in the classroom. The faculty also really want students to express their personal experience. Um, they post, this. these got mixed up a little bit, um, but they also establish, this is for the short voiceover PowerPoints, is accessible materials. And then changing different learning groups to make sure that a lot of different voices are being heard. Whereas students were like, meet with me one on one. That, I mean, that was like, engage me, um, engage students, um, going over the notes in different ways being easily accessible, using online games, like all of these different things. Um, wait a minute, this student slide, this student side is a little weird. Um, they said a lot of things like groups, group work was asked for way more than I totally thought it ever would be. Um, that was really huge. Um, being, you know, being called on, all of those different types of things fell under the student category here. So this was the qualitative part of my study, and I really wanted to see what ideas students and faculty had. You can see there's a lot of overlap, but students and faculty do have some kind of notable differences in like the content of these um, different categories. I also told you that I had them rank the importance of them. Faculty put this, this rank for like what do they find the most important as far as inclusive teaching. That would be creating an inclusive teaching space. If you notice from their qualitative answers, it was number two, but if they were asked to rank them, they put it as number one. So when asked outright, they say that's the most important, which is curious. Um, the students also did not put create an inclusive classroom space is number one, so it kind of flip-flopped when explicitly asked about it. And they put provide accessible course materials as number one, as like on average, which does not match up with their qualitative findings, like the qualitative, the stuff that they're saying. Um, I highlighted the understanding disability laws and concepts because I expected faculty to rate, rank that as higher, but students actually ranked it as higher. And I don't have any data on why, but my assumption might be that I know, just from my job, students often have difficulty getting their accommodations from their faculty, even when asked directly. So I wonder if maybe that is something like, hey, they should know that it's illegal to do that, like to deny me my accommodations. I don't know, I don't actually have data on it. But they had the top three the same, so again, they're conceptualizing what's important relatively similarly. The ratings on the scales, um, this is for attitudes. I have faculty on the right, just kidding, faculty on the left and students on the right. Um, and mostly, this is at a six, like one to six, we're rating attitudes towards these practices really highly, except for course modifications, modifying course content for your students. Um, students ranked that a little bit, as a little bit more important. So that was like something noticeable. Because everything else was above, like five or above. When it comes to the actions that faculty and students are reporting, um, 
the, there is a discrepancy in the accommodations section. So faculty are saying, like, I do this almost all of the time. But students are saying, hey, they only do it sometimes. And the course modifications, uh, it matches up with the faculty attitudes, basically, like, it's not important, and they're not doing it. I think that this might be the most interesting thing. But how does professional development play a role in this? Basically, faculty who reported going to workshops related to inclusive teaching reported more positive attitudes and more actions in their classroom to inclusive, teach like inclusive teaching strategies. This is different from what we saw before in the previous literature. Right? This is saying that like, maybe specifically focusing on inclusive teaching does help both attitudes and implementing the strategy. So much more research is needed in this area. OK, so the main findings. Students and faculty tend to conceptualize in inclusive teaching strategies similarly. However, there are differences in what is rated as most important, which does is supported by previous literature. And professional development might actually help. Right? It increases inclusive teaching strategies. And so what I think is that um, even though that the faculty and students seem to have similar attitudes, maybe the ideas that faculty have about how to make the inclusive experience for students don't address all of the needs of the students. Right? So like we all are saying like these things are important, but how they get implemented, the choices that we make, just might not be lining up exactly. So um, obviously there were some limitations, an extremely white faculty sample, relatively small faculty sample. Students were mostly freshmen and sophomores, which makes sense given the population like, was mostly essentials of psychology students. It was an online survey, so I couldn't ask them for clarification or ask them follow-up questions. Um, and so f for future research, I want to use in more in-depth research, uh, research methods like one-on-one -on -one interviews or focus groups so that I can ask those follow-up questions. Of a stronger focus on the student perspective, because that's lacking in a lot of the literature. And I want to investigate the effectiveness of professional development. Um, and so I generally want to update the literature about inclusive teaching, because a lot of this research was done in like the early 2010s. Um, and so not as much has been done now. And it seems like we're getting, it seems like we might be getting more positive attitudes and even more actions compared to previous research. And so thank you all for listening to me, even though that I was the last person of the day.